Welcome to the Setzer Church Leaders Podcast, where we're helping Christian leaders navigate and lead through the cultural issues of our day. My name is Daniel Yang, the director of the Church Multiplication Institute, and we're excited to have with us today Reverend Dr. Glenn Packham. Reverend Dr. Glenn is associate senior pastor at New Life Church in Colorado Springs and lead pastor of the church's downtown congregation. He's also a senior fellow at Barna Group, a visiting fellow at St. John's College at Durham University, and an adjunct professor at Denver Seminary. His latest book is The Resilient Pastor, Leading Your Church in a Rapidly Changing World. But before we hear from Glenn, let's go to Ed Setzer, editor-in-chief of Outreach Magazine and the executive director of Wheaton College Billy Graham Center. Reverend Dr. Ed Reverend Stetzer. Doctor. Reverend I Doctor. I should, said, should have said that. Too. I feel like you should have. I feel like you should have. But I'm yeah. going to be okay with that. But I was impressed that you said that. And there's so many, you know, you could talk to Glenn forever. Like we, we were tagging out recently. I'm like, Anglican, New Life. I'm so confused. So fascinating conversations. But that's not what we're going to talk about today. Because we're going to talk about today what I think is going to be right at the heart of a lot of pastors in this cultural moment. I mean, it, 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 it's hard not to notice that everything's on fire. And, you know, I, I've been talking about how we're in the midst of a cultural convulsion. We're in a time when uh, it's probably the hardest time to lead in certainly my lifetime, probably in most of our listeners' lifetime. I mean, I know there might be individual situations that have been hard to lead through, but the world's on fire. Um, I love the language resilient pastor because, you know, we launched the, uh, uh, we did the the Resilient Church Leaders Mm -hmm. Initiative. You're part of that um, right in the middle of COVID. And now people are like, what does it look like to have resilience? One of the things I'm ending most of my seminar, I'm doing a common seminar on the cultural convulsion and the great sort. I'm ending with it. This cultural convulsion is going on for a few more years. You're going to need reservoirs of Hmm. resilience. So I feel like I'm going around promoting Glenn's book. It's called The Resilient Pastor, Leading Your Church in a Rapidly Changing World. Now, I want to get to the book, but first, let's get a little bit about you, your Hmm. ministry background, connection with Barna, Hmm. and then where that led to with this book. Daniel, Ed, thank you so much for having me on. Always good to uh, talk to you guys and very much excited about this topic today. I'm originally from Malaysia. It's where I grew up, moved to the States when I was 10. My parents went to Bible college in Portland, Oregon, Uh, moved back to Malaysia, finished up my high school years there, and then came out to the States to go to college. And then from there, ended up at New Life Church. I've been at New Life for 22 years. So that's kind of my my backdrop, a little bit of my um, story. Had had, uh, maybe the first decade of my time at New Life in the worship ministry world. Um, did some traveling in those years as well, and then switched into kind of this teaching pastoral role and have been leading this downtown congregation for about 10 years now. And, you know, when, we, when I think about this book, David approached me, David Kinneman, president of Barna, he approached me at the beginning of 2020 and said, hey, what do you think about partnering with us to kind of write something about the challenges that pastors are facing, changing world I mean, we had no idea. This was this was like a month before the pandemic. Wow. And and I naively I said, man, it sounds like an exciting uh, project to work on with you guys. And of course, when the pandemic hit, we realized, boy, this could be a for such a time as this sort of project. So I outlined eight challenges, four facing the pastor and four facing the church, and then got to work with their research team to design these questions that went out to uh, hundreds of pastors in late 2020. We got some questions that went out to the general population, kind of, you, you mentioned the sort of cultural upheaval, Ed. Uh, we wanted to know are, what are changing attitudes toward the pastor or toward uh, the church. And so we had some questions there in the general population side. And then I wanted to get a little bit more than, you know, kind of behind this, the, the numbers and the stats a bit. So I kind of recruited people to join a focus group, just, you know, I used Twitter, social media, and got pastors from the US, Canada, and the UK to join three different focus groups. And we spent 90 minutes each uh, talking through some of these challenges. But the goal of the book is not just data. I mean, if you think about it, though, all of those pieces, that forms the insight, if you will, into the cultural kind of moment or the cultural sort of challenges. But we wanted I wanted to pair insight with wisdom. And so the wisdom kind of resources from scripture, of course, but then also from uh, church history, from moments, you know, Ed, you said, this is one of the most difficult times. It's true in recent memory or in our generation, but of course, when we look farther back in church history, we say, hang on a minute, maybe there's some, there's some light, there's some hope that we can draw on from our story. Yeah, and I, lo- I love that the wisdom is evident throughout. You know, it's, I mean, I think you mentioned you started writing this in uh, 2020, and we all started seeing something different. Maybe it was around the yeah. pandemic where yeah. if you stopped the meeting, I'm 96% of churches, I think, stopped meeting during the first shutdown, two weeks and then the month. Um, but if you didn't come right back, uh, people were soon calling you a compromised coward. And maybe you said, well, we're going to wear masks. And people were saying, and then then maybe eventually, most places you said, well, we're going to stop wearing masks, or maybe we're going to recommend it. 
and then people were like, you're terrible and people yeah, are going to die. Yeah, and yeah, you, yeah. you, and we could 50 issues where things that were non-controversial now everyone's mad. And so when you kind of, and I love, so I love the fact this book kind of was emerging in and through the season uh, of the pandemic, because I think conversations about the resilient pastor five years ago are just, uh, are just different. So different. we all know it's been a real hard couple of years. Um, mm -hmm. What are the challenges that pastors are dealing with? What did, Yes, you partnered with Barna, and I should also mention that uh, that Glenn and I we did the Barna State of Your Church together, which yes, uh, people can still find online, get more information about that. Um, but what are the challenges you and Barna found, and how are they impacting church leaders? Well, I'll, I'll pick a couple on the pastor side, and then there's definitely some on the church side, sort of the the wider kind of challenges facing the church. But on the pastor side, you guys, I, I mean. One of the things that really emerged is there's, there's a shaking in vocational confidence. So there was some data that we were able to track from 2015 and comparing it with late 2020 um, about the, the question was, are you more confident of your calling now than when you first began in ministry? And in 2015, it was like, you know, 65% of pastors were like, yeah, more, more confident. And now that's dropped to like 35%. So the, the, the way I kind of sum it up is, more pastors are less confident and fewer pastors are more confident. So there's a kind of vocational um, confidence has been shaken. And then, and then there's the other issue here that really stood out to me about credibility. That was a, a, a really sharp sort of contrast. We asked people, the general population, do you consider a pastor to be a trustworthy source of wisdom? And, you know, non-Christians, only 4% said yes, absolutely. So, mm. okay, that's, you know, maybe not surprising, but 4% is pretty low. 18% said yes, somewhat. But then, you know, e even then you're kind of like, okay, well, these are non-Christians, you know, whatever. But when we, when we, when it came to Christians, that number was really, really low. Uh, well, low in my, in my estimation was only 71% combined said yes, somewhat, or yes, absolutely. Which look as a pastor, it just confirms my suspicions that there's a third of, of the people out there on any given Sunday, kind of listening to you going, yeah, maybe, you know, hmm. you, you know, Glenn, I mean, you could have called this book, the healthy pastor or the vibrant <laughs> pastor, but you, you call it the, the resilient pastor. And I think there's probably a reason to that. And uh, a big part of the book is focused on pastors investing in their own spiritual development. Yeah. So uh, how much do you think pastors are, are prioritizing their spiritual lives? And specifically, like, what's the connection between that and being resilient? Because okay. resilience is different than just being happy or right. healthy, right? It means you can endure. That's exactly right, Daniel, and I'm so glad you said that. You know, when I think about resilience, I think about the story that uh, or the former chief rabbi of the British Commonwealth, Lord Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, uh, he's, he's, he's passed away now, but he talked about the story of going to his doctor for like a health checkup, and he gets on the treadmill, and they've got all the sensors on him, and, you know, maybe some of the listeners have, have had an experience like this, but Rabbi Sachs, you know, says, I, I was wondering, what, what are we measuring? So he's like, Doc, are you measuring how fast I can run? Doc's like, no. And he goes, are you measuring how far I can run? I'm like, no, I'm not measuring that either. And, you know, he's increasing the incline and the speed and he's, you know, under duress, he's huffing and puffing and he gets off and he's like, doc, what are we, what are we measuring here? And the doc says, I'm measuring how quickly you recover to health, how, how quickly you mm. get back to a, a good and proper heart rate, a resting heart rate. And I thought, you know, that's it. So many of us as pastors and church leaders, we've sort of thought the mark of being quote unquote great or healthy or whatever is how fast we can run or how far we can run or how big our churches can get. And, and I think what we're realizing is actually resilience or to put it another way, recovery and recalibration. Those are the markers of health. How quickly do we recover to a place of centeredness in our grounding in Christ? Uh, how quickly do we recalibrate towards true north? So you mentioned spiritual practices, Daniel. I mean, this is, this is it. One of the other uh, chapters in the book is about spirituality and about how we cultivate this kind of deep life with God. And I think, you know, pa pastors have that. It's about 50-50 how many of them are practicing uh, stuff outside the church, outside of their kind of work life. And, and that's, the, that's the test for us is, can you cultivate a deep life with God with spiritual practices beyond the ones you're leading your congregation in? So I, I think what ends up happening is we, we get a little dull 
to the practices that we're engaging in all the time as a leader. So, you know, maybe you, you do, you're a church that has modern worship or whatever. Well, maybe for your own life with God, you need a different kind of well, as it were. You, you need to drink from the well of uh, maybe it's psalm praying or an ancient prayer, like the prayer of exam. You know, Ed, you joked about the Anglican thing. I think that in my journey, that's been one of the reasons for resourcing from these older spiritual practices to say, I'm in a church that's primarily leaning in one way, I, I need a different well to nourish my own soul. Oh, I love the picture of a different well. Um, one of the things that we've seen is, and I actually experienced this early on in the pandemic. I got to the place where, <laughs> um, where I just was beyond my limits. I was, I had to step back for a little while. It was a real time of, uh, you know, it just became too much. We early on were just serving churches through our, through our, uh, with coronavirus resources, helping churches get ready. I mean, Daniel was involved in uh, over ten thousand churches, part of mentoring groups and more. <laughs> And we were all just worn out. And for me, it just came day I got to step back. And I didn't, you know, it was all early on. We were all in. Um, but it's not sustainable for yeah. years, right? Yeah. So a 30-day yeah. sprint, mm -hmm. you know, flipping your church this way, changing this, et cetera, et cetera. So what are some signs that pastors should be looking for that they're living beyond their limits? Let me remind everyone who's listening that the book is The Resilient Pastor, Leading Your Church in a Rapidly Changing World, deals with some of these issues. What are some signs you're beyond your limits? I, I think you can ask yourself a question like, when was the last time you had a Sabbath? Um, uh, many pastors, we, we sort of feel like a Sabbath is a luxury. But I also think there's other signs like, when, when was the last time you had a meal with friends, genuine friends, uh, not, not just people in the church that you were trying to build a relationship with or, or reach out to or rope in or you know, connect or recruit or whatever. And I say that not because I'm cynical, but I say that because it, it, another one of the chapters dealt with the challenge of relationships. And I'm telling you, the data that, that so many pastors, three out of five pastors reported feeling lonely in, 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 a, in, in the past year. And so one of the signs that we're moving too fast and we're, we're just trying to run too hard is there's no space for the, the kind of Sabbath with the Lord, but then also no space for genu genuine recreation with friends. Years ago, there was a study done by the University of Kansas, I think, about how many hours it takes to actually develop friendships. And it's something like 200 plus hours, leisure hours, hmm. uh, in order to become close friends with someone. I mean, ask a pastor, how many leisure hours do you have in a week? I mean, I ask myself that and I think, I, I don't know. And so it's a little bit, you know, I, I, I'm in Colorado Springs, been here for 22 years, a lot of military establishments here. Soldiers come back from combat and they'll talk to us about how PTSD works. It's not until you kind of reintegrate into quote unquote normal life or non-battle, non-combat sort of context that then the adrenaline flushes from your system and these signs sort of show up. And I think, I think for many of us, it's going to be the next six you know, maybe nine, 12 months for pastors and church leaders, when we quote unquote return to normal, I use that very carefully, uh, that all of a sudden we're going to realize, why, why, am I, why am I more agitated? Why am I more uh, uh, suspicious? Why am I uh, so uptight? Why can't I sit still and relax? And it could be that the adrenaline has washed from our system hmm. and now we're, we're showing the signs of this sort of, you know, leadership PTSD, if you will. Hmm. Yeah, a huge connection between recovery, what you said earlier, and, and the relationships around you. And Glenn, I wonder if you don't mind like me pressing into a little bit more of your personal story, because you mentioned this, you spent the first 10 years of your life at New Life uh, in, in leading the worship ministry and, and now leading the downtown campus. So you went from writing songs to writing <laughs> books now, and and part of that is a rediscovery and re reimagining of your pastoral call. And I think a lot of my friends who are leading churches, they're, they're in that process where they're like, I, I know I want to pastor, but I can't keep doing the same thing I was doing before. And the pandemic became a catalyst for them to reevaluate and to also maybe reorient and rediscover what their calling is moving forward. Like, wh what have you learned in your own journey and how can you help pastors who are experiencing like a similar moment right now? You know, I think, I, I, I think the first thing I'd want to say is to take the shame out of the question, you know, if someone's raising the question, should I, can I stay at this local church? Can I stay in this current role? Uh, there's no, there's no shame in that question. It's not automatically a question that comes of unfaithfulness. Uh, in fact, sometimes in order to remain faithful to Jesus and to his call uh, on our lives, we need to hold loosely before the Lord. And I had several um, decision points or checkpoints, if you will, along my journey and continue to have um, where I hold that question before the Lord. One of those 
moments came in, in, in 2010. I, I write about this in the book about getting to meet uh, Eugene Peterson and spend a couple of days in his home. That was a vocational checkpoint uh, for me of saying, I think I'm discerning this transition between expressing this pastoral calling in one way via the worship stuff. And I think I'm discerning, you know, expressing it another way. But I, I also wondered, should I, do I need to change the context more radically? Did I need to leave, you know, the, the church I was at? And, and I was grateful for a sage kind of voice in that, in that season, in that crossroads kind of moment to speak into that and, and discerning that. So I, I want to, I would want to take the shame away from the question. And then secondly, I'd want to say, I think there's a core part of our calling that remains consistent, even if it takes different shape, uh, shapes throughout our, our lives. And so good guides, good retreats, good resources um, can actually help us dig deeper on vocational discernment to say, how is it you make sense of your life's calling uh, and, and how might that uh, take, take shape in different ways? And, and so I've, I've been through several different, you know, sometimes seminars, sometimes retreats where those, those questions were raised. And then I think the third thing I would say, Daniel, is, okay, take the shame away from it. Okay, find out the actual core of your calling. But then thirdly, the, the life source of your calling is ultimately all of us, for every Christian, not just every pastor, our calling is to Christ himself. You know, Jesus, when he called the disciples, it says he called them to himself, uh, to be with him. And then he sent them out to go, you know, uh, do all this stuff. And so I, I think when we find ourselves at seasons of disruption, of vocational discernment, uh, we, we need to remind ourselves that the source of our calling is Christ himself. And there's a kind of intimacy with him that we've got to be grounded in as we go and explore some of these other questions. So good, so good. The uh, the book we're talking about is the Resilient Pastor, Dr. Glenn Packiam, and unpacking some of these things in in the book. You talk about the kind of the tribalism we've seen in the last few years as a failure of discipleship. I've, I've often said people are being discipled by their cable news choices, mm -hmm. spiritually shaped by their social media feed. At the event we did with David Kinneman, David said one of the things we learned is they're just not as much into you as you thought. Talking to pastors <laughs> and church leaders, they're just not as much into you. They've been shaped by other forces. Can you talk about your own experience as a pastor with some of that tribalism? Um, and what do we do if it's a failure of discipleship? What do we do to yeah. work through that? I'll tell two quick stories. One of my own, I, I showed up in church, this was probably sometime in the summer of 2020, and I was wearing a mask. And a congregant stopped me and he says, what are you, what are you doing? You're going to go rob a bank here? You know, some sort of snarky kind of deal. And, and, and I tell the story in the book, actually. And we, we're laughing about it. It's, it's fairly lighthearted. It's, he's not a, a angry. But he proceeds to tell me about a sermon that he's listened to from another pastor to another church in another city about, you know, kind of that pastor's particular apocalyptic interpretation of this cultural moment, blah, blah, blah. And he's telling it to me on the uh, assumption here that I don't really know what I'm doing. I've not read the Bible or studied the Bible, but this other uh, expert online has. And it, it corresponds with a question that or a comment that showed up in one of my focus groups, a pastor, uh, uh, I can't remember which state he was in, but he said, you know, the downside of everything going online is people figured out after a couple of weeks, shoot, if I'm watching church online, I can watch whoever I want. And he, and this, mm -hmm. This local pastor said, how was I supposed to compete with this sort of hot, you know, um, very fancy, slick kind of service and preacher? So there, there is a challenge even within the church. Well, you mentioned cable news. I, I'm saying even within who, which pastors we're listening yeah, to for sure. uh, and which podcast we're listening to, there, there's, there's that. And then, of course, you add on to that, all the different voices. So, Ed, when, we, when I think about how we... Uh, how we face this challenge of discipleship. I mean, my goodness, there's, there's so many layers to this and that we can't, you know, we can't solve this in one, in one kind of silver bullet here. But I, I do think there are three threads that I have noticed, probably you have noticed as you've done all this research and work as well, both of you. And, and one, one thread is, and this is sort of the mark of the church in the 200s, you know, the church before, you know, pre-Constantine, I, I, I referenced the church in Carthage in North Africa with Cyprian, there's a teaching component of it, but the teaching is about the teachings of Jesus. So think about the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, think about the, the way Jesus was instructing his disciples to actually live. Sometimes our teaching is so focused on this sort of uh, 
heaven hell transaction that then the way we're supposed to live is kind of optional extra credit but discipleship at the at, at, at the very least jesus said make disciples you know in every nation teaching them to obey what i have commanded you so there's a sense in which we're supposed to teach the teachings of jesus and then so the second component i think about is practices um, you, you know, lots of people have noticed this, have reflected on this, that we've, we've, we've opted for an overly cognitive approach to discipleship when the truth is we're formed in our emotions, we're formed in our affections, we're formed in our habits. And so there's, there's some practices we've got to think carefully about. If our practices are just as consumeristic as the world, but our content, quote unquote, is Jesus-y, I just don't think that's enough. There's got to be a, a, a um, a coherence between our practices and our content. And then the third thing is truly an apprenticing community. Um, I, we, many discipleship approaches, approaches focus on this one-on-one -on -one thing, you know, and I think that's good. I think that's probably really helpful when a person's a new believer, but I suspect that as we get on, you know, in, in our walk with the Lord, it's not so much the one-on-one -on -one stuff. It's actually an apprenticing community, a community that's able to say, I don't know about that. Or maybe God, and actually in my life, my friends, the, the best role they have played in my life is to show me where the cross is in a particular season mm -hmm. of my life. So I'm saying, oh, guys, I'm wrestling with this and I'm complaining about this or that. And one of them will say, gee, Glenn, I wonder if there's a cross here. I wonder if there's an invitation mm -hmm. to die here. And that's, the, that's what I mean by an apprenticing community, a community that is teaching each other to recognize and pick up our crosses in daily life. Yeah. I mean, that's really important for like the internal factors of the church. Yeah. One of the other dimensions, and I, I hear Ed and you, you both talk about this where we really shouldn't, you know, put uh, Christ and culture and pit them against each other. But the reality is that outside the church, like pastors don't have a great uh, reputation. I think we're kind of in between lawyers and politicians. Um, <laughs> not a great place. To not be. a great place yeah. to be. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, without having to kind of pit culture and Christians against one another, I mean, the reality is that there is that dynamic. And so, hmm. what, what do you think? How do we respond to the fact that there are, you know, we're, we're looked at as not trusted uh, yeah. in American culture? Yeah, Daniel, thanks for that question. Certainly coming back to one of the, the, the challenges of credibility um, that we reflected on in the book. And I, I I'm hesitant to, to, I think our impulse is always to, how can I fix this? And that's not your question, but I think I want to be careful that I don't give an answer that sounds like I'm saying, well, here's how we fix it, you know, because I think we have to do the right thing for the right reason. <laughs> and, and that's, in the end, that's what fidelity, that's what faithfulness to Jesus and to his kingdom is about. It's not ultimately results oriented. It doesn't guarantee um, and I, you know, Old Testament wise, I always think about the difference between Jeremiah and, and Jonah, you know, Jonah had all the results, the whole city, you know, none of it repents, but he had all the results and none of the faithfulness, none of the obedience. Oh, wow. Jeremiah had all of the faithfulness and none of the results. And, and in, in God's economy, one is definitely more important than the other. And so can we change the attitudes of our culture toward us? No, uh, nor should that be our goal. But I, I, I think the place that I go to when I think about this reality is it invites me, it's an, it's an invitation into confession, an invitation to say, dear God, how have I been complicit in the loss of credibility? How have I uh, specifically um, mishandled influence or authority? How have I um, been, been rash in our use of authority, been, been sort of too much bravado from the pulpit or, or, or too dismissive or too, you know, utilitarian about oh, plugging people in to serve and and I think maybe the ways I have stewarded power have actually um, made me a participant in this problem. So there's a confession there. And then there's an invitation to, to really consider Jesus. And power itself is not the problem. It's our definition of, of how power is expressed and to what end power is used. Um, so power in the way of Jesus has to be expressed. My, my friend Kyle Strobel and Jamin Gogan wrote this book, The Way of the Dragon, The Way of the Great Lamb. Book. Uh, and, and he says that this, they say it this way, power expressed in weakness for the purpose of love, for the sake of love. And so when I think about the credibility problem, I think not only do we need to confess, but we need to think carefully about how we are using power. And is our power as leaders being expressed in weakness for the sake of love, or is it being expressed through control for the sake of domination? That's how uh, Strobel and Gogan say it in, in their book. So will, again, will that result in the world kind of saying, oh, we love pastors. Ah, I have no idea, <laughs> but we need to do this regardless.
Yeah, I do think the the time of being universally loved um, has probably shifted in our culture. But I think the question you asked is so helpful is what do we need to address in our own approach that's hurt that? Some of that's because we believe things about our mainstream culture now. Some of that's because we have not thrived well as leaders and in that culture uh, as well. So if you, if you look, put on your 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 future thinking hat, um, because we've we've heard the Barna data that 38% of pastors, you know, mm -hmm. thinking about quitting and more, mm -hmm. um, and that number's gone up. So we did we don't have that number from five years ago. So it's a little hard to know sure. if that's a one year blip, if that's a pattern, if that's a trend. Right. I'm of the view that probably in the next few months, probably summer 2022, because pastors, there's an old adage in like building campaigns. If you have a building campaign, the pastor is going to quit like three months after the building campaign. Because it's like the pastor wants to get the the church over the building campaign. And it's like, oh, forget it now. Um, and I think a lot of that, a lot of pastors are trying to get their church maybe to Easter, uh, yeah. maybe yeah. beyond Easter, yeah. um, get it through the pandemic. And, and of course, mm -hmm. you know, we don't know what all that means in the future. So we haven't seen the huge mass of resignations, but I'm kind of of the view that a lot of people are really thinking about it. Are you how, how might we respond? Because people will be listening right now, and this might be their like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm thinking about quitting, or we may all be there in two months. How would you encourage us to respond at that moment to our call, to the role, to those kinds of things? I think you you want to take seriously the advice that St. Ignatius gave his followers, never make a life-changing decision in a season of desolation. Um and so you're right, Ed, I think there's a latency to all of this that's going to show up kind of after we oh, exhale here. And, and that's not the moment to say, okay, now I'm going to make this life changing decision. So one, you got to wait until you're not in the depths of that desolation of, of post, you know, whatever, post pandemic. But I, I think the other part of it is we got to have the right people around us. We got to have the right relationships. I mentioned a sage type voice earlier. But we also need healers. Uh, we, 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 and I think of counselors, spiritual directors, therapists, usually someone that you're, there's, a, uh, there's a financial commitment. My friend Steve Cuss says it that way. You, know, you have a financial investment into uh, someone else helping you pay attention to your health. Um, that, those kinds of voices can help us notice things that we don't notice about ourselves. And you know, we talked about the lack of, of genuine peers and, and friendships of mutuality and all that. That's, that's certainly another piece of it. But I just want to name again, the, the sage and the healer. I, I think those are going to become really important voices for church leaders. And, and many, again, just to, some of the data we asked about how many pastors see a counselor or see a spiritual director, it's, it's a pretty low number. And I think that's the stuff that we're going to have to maybe acquaint ourselves with. Okay, maybe I need to take on um, a, a director, if for nothing else, to help me discern um, God's will and God's calling in the midst of this, so that I'm not just reacting to a kind of fatigue. Yeah, you know, most of our listeners are pastors or church leaders, or they lead Christian organizations. And again, coming back to the just the concept of being resilient. Um, mm. If you could speak to them as we kind of wrap up our time here of how to pursue resilience, uh, what would you hope they're taking away from this conversation? You know, I keep, I keep saying, you know, Jesus and relationships, it really does come down to that. I, 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 and I want to come back to the Jesus piece in a second, but I think one, one piece that maybe you haven't touched on is this idea of collaboration. Um, toward the end of the book, I, I talk about the future of the church being collaborative on several layers, collaborative in the sense of symbiotic influence, meaning our streams and traditions are enriching each other. I think, I think when I look at some of my friends in, in Europe or in the UK, that's what I see over there is less of this tribalistic kind of our fence, our people, our way, and more of this cross-pollination, symbiotic influence. Um, I, but I also think... Um, uh, collaboration looks like missional partnerships in our own communities. Um, we learned a lot of that during COVID. We learned how to rally together and do food banks and do all this sort of stuff. I, I would say keep working those muscles, you know, keep working those muscles because the, 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 when we recover from this fatigue, don't forget the lessons we learned during the, the stress of the crisis. And one of those lessons is you can't do this alone. We need each other. One church is not going to be the super church for a city, you know. And then the, maybe the third layer of, of collaboration. So think of it as going, you know, from big circles into smaller circles. The third layer is healthy teams. I, I, I think, guys, there, 
the expectations on a pastor uh, for her to be a sort of, you know, counselor, theologian, priest, entrepreneur, social activist, it's their impossible expectations. And yet we can't just scold people and say, stop having expectations. I think part of what we have to do is think differently about how we build leadership teams in churches. And, th and that's going to be part of the, the lesson that we take forward. But my, 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 my charge, you know, kind of devotionally to pastors is think of that moment in John 21 when Jesus found Peter, you know, fishing again. And, and we don't know, was he doing, just, was he fishing for the weekend or was he, had he returned to it? Or was he disoriented and, and about his own vocation? I'm not exactly sure, but those, the, the way Jesus kind of interrupts him in that moment of fishing is just like the, the, the circumstances surrounding Peter's first call, except this time it's very different. Instead of saying, follow me and I'll make you a fisher of men, uh, it, it's less that the purpose part of it really kind of takes a back seat. And Jesus foregrounds this key question, do you love me? Now, like every pastor who's listening to this, you've preached probably a dozen sermons on this and talked about the different Greek words for love and blah, blah, blah. But I think, I think the thing that is maybe the most important word in the question is the word me. Mm -hmm. um, so for, for pastors, I'm less interested that you'll come out of this and say, I love the church and I love the kingdom. And I love, you know, Jesus doesn't say, Peter, do you love miracles? You're about to do some great miracles. He doesn't say, do you love a move of God? He's about to see people get saved. He says, Peter, do you love me? Mm -hmm. And my primary concern is not that I motivate pastors to love the church again or love the kingdom again. I just, man, can we just love Jesus again? And then let's see what Jesus leads us into in the season that's coming next. Well, you've been listening to tremendous insight from Glenn sure. Packiam. You can learn more about uh, Glenn at glennpackiam.com and be sure to check out his book, The Resilient Pastor, Leading Your Church in a Rapidly Changing World. And thanks again for listening to the Sets of Church Leaders podcast. You can find more interviews as well as other great content for ministry leaders at churchleaders.com. And again, if you found our conversation today helpful, we'd love for you to take a few moments to leave us a review that'll help other ministry leaders find us and benefit from our content. Thanks for listening. We'll see you in the next episode.